All right, great. Well, once again, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming for uh, part two. I hope that part one was enjoyable and that you were able to get something out of it. And hopefully, uh, my hope is, is that you'll get even more out of this session as well. Uh, so once again, um, my name is Brandon Mack, pronouns he, him, his. I'm an activist, educator, organizer with Black Lives Matter Houston. And this evening, our presentation will be on moving from ally to accomplice. So to give you an overview of what we will be going through through this session, I'm gonna start first with two questions. Uh, then we'll delve into what is an ally, what is an accomplice, ways in which we move from an ally to an accomplice, uh, how do we have some difficult conversations? We'll discuss defund the police versus abolish the police, engage in a dialogue amongst ourselves, and then talk about some resources, and we will go from there. So first, two questions, and this is going to involve some participation. Um, I really want to get a sense from those who are here, if you are comfortable, as to why you are here and what do you want to get out of this workshop today? So for any brave soul who's willing to ask the central question, why are you here and what do you want to get out of this workshop today? Well, I'm here because I want to continue to learn about Black Lives Matter. Uh, I'm in a group that's um, going through something called Sacred Ground, an Episcopal church study about racism. <clears throat> and uh, we haven't encountered or haven't talked about Black Lives Matter. But, but in thinking about the difference between an ally and accomplice, I'm, I'm de definitely wanting oh, yeah. to figure out what it takes to be an accomplice. Yeah, and James, he's another, yeah. All right, thank yeah. you so much, Ms. He's Joy. Always, he's always um, good. If, any, if you could please mute your mic just so that we can make sure we can hear everyone. Um, for another person who would be willing to say uh, why are you here and what do you want to get out of today's workshop? I know one person put into the chat wanting to get some insight into how to talk to other white people about racism. Excellent. Anyone else? I would like to I would I would like to know more about Black Lives Matter. I'd like to know more about the um, and, and you did a, a, a really great job last week, Brandon, of helping me understand what the organization is about because there's so much um, noise on social media and in the news about what, um, about Black Lives Matter, but no one's talking about what it is and what it isn't. And um, I think if I truly want to move from ally to accomplice that I have to know what it is I'm supporting and how I can best do that. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, some other ones in the chat and then we will get, uh, move forward. Wanting to find ways for me and my congregation to be more involved in anti-racism work in our community. Uh, what Joyce said, the move from ally to accomplice, that sounds more focused to me, I may be wrong. And looking for ways to engage uh, corporate employees in dialogue. Excellent. Um, the reason why I asked these two uh, kind of central questions is one, to make sure that I'm meeting the needs of what everyone here is trying to get or as best and close to meeting that. And then also for us to ground ourselves as to why we are engaging in this work, because to really move from being a mere ally to an accomplice, you have to be grounded in a reason. And it truly needs to be the reason for why you want to do and engage in racial justice work. Because the place and space that we are in society is no longer from an allyship perspective. That is just way too soft and not what we need right now. What we need is more direct action, more action-oriented action. And that's the hope that I'm that I'm hoping you will come away with from here is to really understand that if you're going to be involved in this, it needs to be grounded in a truly authentic reason, because that's what's going to keep you sustained in engaging in the work that is necessary to move us better and better as a society and for us to engage in anti-racism. So 
that'll be some of the things that we will cover this evening. But thank you all so much for sharing that because I wanted to once again get a temperature of what we are going to commit ourselves to and the reason for why we are here in this workshop and together. So let's get into it. So what is an ally? So the easy, the definition that I generally use when it comes to allies are these, are this. They are vocal against problematic existence of certain types of, op of oppression. And that's usually where it stops. Allyship is very performative. As you can see in the photo that I use here, these are the individuals who will come to a protest, they'll take a selfie, and that's generally where it ends. So allies, they will speak out against actions as long as the potential for risk and danger are minimized. So what I mean by that is that when you will see an ally, they will be the ones who will say, oh, I'm an ally and I'm in support of this community, but being in support of any marginalized community generally doesn't come at a great risk. So it's easy to demonstrate support, especially when you don't have any fear of loss. So you could say, hey, I support Black Lives Matter Houston, or I support Black Lives Matter, and it being in a progressive space, that's just mere allyship because you really don't have any loss that is gonna be a tied to you associating yourself or with being and demonstrating allyship. You're not gonna lose your job. You're not gonna lose your life potentially. You're not going to lose your status in society with allyship. And because of that, it's very easy for people to be able to say, oh, I'm an ally because there's no sense of loss. But it's also easy for when those communities feel pain or experience pain, it's also easy for you to step away from that group or not continue to engage because once again, you don't have anything to lose. In a sense, you don't have any skin in the game. Also, allies ask marginalized people to justify their position for the benefit of their own learning. So this is when you end up being an ally and you're like, oh, I need you to justify why I need to support you. Why should you have to justify doing the right thing? Why should you have to justify supporting people who have been marginalized in this country, people who have never been at the center of the discussions and knowledge and even their own characterization in this society? Um, allies, they will amplify the message of marginalized communities through their lens without crediting or creating a platform for that community. So this is what I like to often say is co-opting the message. This is when you will see instead of the message being direct from a black person about the black experience, it will go through a filter and being said by a white appearing person or another person who is not directly a part of that community because they feel it is nicer and will appeal better. Why are you robbing that community of their voice? Why are you not just taking their own authentic experience? Why does it have to go through a filter to be nice and sounding correct? Because once again, when you do that, you're centering your perspective. You're centering the white perspective rather than centering the marginalized perspective and the marginalized voice to speak about their own experience. And that is co-optation, which allies engage in. And then they will only engage with threats of oppression theoretically, not acknowledge or engage in the realities. So these will be individuals who will talk about this in a very hypothetical way. They'll pose it as a rhetorical question, but when it comes to actually the realities, once again, of that lived experience, they're not willing to accept it. As I often like to say, these will be individuals who wanna have a psychological conversation 
but not a sociological conversation. And what I mean by that is that when I have conversations with individuals about what goes on in the Black community, I'm having it from a sociological standpoint, meaning that I'm talking about it from large group commonalities. What I often see with allies is that they will bring up one example that they feel cancels out all the other sociological data. So this will be an individual who say, oh, I know this one person because of this one person and my interaction with them, they can't be racist. When we're talking about systemic and larger things that will be done outside of your presence, which could still suggest that that person is racist because racist is a more global sociological context and one example doesn't cancel out the system. And once again, and the biggest thing is allyship is performative. We don't need any more performances. We just had the Oscars. Didn't go exactly the way I wanted it to go, but that's another conversation for another day. But still, it's all performances and performances are not getting us to where we need to go. What we need is direct action. Now I have an example and a very recent example that I wanna to talk to you about allyship gone wrong and someone you don't ever wanna be. And that is Sharon Osbourne. Don't be a Sharon. Sharon Osbourne to me demonstrated the perfect example of an ally. So for anyone who didn't see the infamous now March 10th interview or conversation on the talk. Sharon Osborne engaged in a conversation with her fellow co-hosts, two of which are Black women, Cheryl Underwood and Elaine Wetterow, in which she was defending her comments about Pierce Morgan. Pierce Morgan used his platform on Good Morning Britain to not only suggest that Meghan Markle was lying about what she said in her Oprah interview, he also used the platform to dismiss Megan's experiences related to mental health. What Pierce did was racism because he used his platform, which was a national platform to dismiss and degrade a black woman's experience. And he didn't do it just once. He did it repeatedly. And even when other black women came on to the talk show to defend Meghan Markle, he continuously dismissed those black women. So it's the repeated actions, but also the use of a platform against an individual that makes it racist. Now, Sharon Osbourne wanted to defend her friend. But when she had two Black women tell her that what was going on from their perspective was racism, her immediate reaction was demanding education and suggesting that they were wrong. To me, this is once again, an issue of allyship because she immediately got defensive. She immediately was demanding education from marginalized people. She wasn't acknowledging their lived experience and just felt literally saying, I'm not a racist was enough. One thing that was very specific in that interview and that interaction was when her co-host said, it's not enough now to just be not racist. You have to be anti-racist, which means you have to do direct action to call out your friend when they're wrong. To question the situation, especially from the marginalized per person's perspective, rather than centering your own perspective. And then if you notice, ever since she's left the talk, 
She hasn't acknowledged what she's done is wrong. Instead, she has defended herself and defended Pierce Morgan's right to continue to carry on in a racist fashion. Why did she do it that way? She has nothing to lose. She's not willing to challenge her friend and to challenge her status quo. She's just willing to let that behavior continue. That level of complicity is violent. And it's not just violent towards the Black community. It's violent toward any other marginalized community where we see all these different isms not being challenged. So think of it this way. If Sharon Osbourne had said something that was anti-Semitic, and if her co-host allowed that to stand, they would be complicit in anti-Semitism. So if we truly want to see various isms broken down, we have got to actively challenge them and not just let them stand. So I say this once again, don't be a sharing, okay? When this happens, when you are ever engaged in these conversations, whenever you are engaged in this work, you got to take a step back. See how all these things interact with each other. Don't be silent because if you're silent, then you're being complicit. Don't demand educa education. You can ask and engage in that dialogue. But when you're demanding, you're using your power and your privilege once again to center yourself rather than centering marginalized communities. And also don't be defensive. You can make mistakes and you'll and I will definitely talk about that. But it's always about how in the way that you engage that makes it very, very clear that you're willing to be in community with other marginalized communities or are you going to center yourself and keep your power and privilege? So don't be a sharing. What I am asking us to do is to become accomplices. So here's where we get into what is an accomplice. An accomplice is someone who is willing to do the work of unlearning, actively combating and leveraging their privilege against oppression. So this is definitely way more action oriented. The process of unlearning is very, very important because once again, we got to think about how have we been educated in the ways of this society. The ways that we have been educated have always been through a centered, intentional white lens. Think about the United States history classes that we all took when we were in K through 12 education. How often do we learn about indigenous people? How often do we learn about Black history? How often do we learn about Latino, Hispanic history? How often do we learn about other cultural histories? We often didn't. But the history we were demanded and were forced to learn was primarily through a white, male, cisgendered perspective. And thus, that's whose standards have always been at the center. And also, you have to think about who has had the ability to really characterize themselves and their cultures. The definitions of a lot of cultures haven't been from their old cultures defining themselves. It's been through that white European perspective. So Blackness and how people think about Blackness hasn't really been done for Black people defining themselves. It's been done by those who've been in those power and privilege stances, being able to define who are Black people. So that goes back to my first presentation where we talk about slavery and the fact that me as a Black person, when I came to this country, I was not defined as a human. I was defined as property. And over time, the characterization of Black people has evolved but at the same time, it hasn't evolved under our control primarily. 
because we have a bid in those places and spaces and in those positions of power to be able to divide ourselves. So the way that Black men, for example, get labeled as being criminals, the way that Black men get labeled as being dangerous, all those things are coming from people who have had the ability to be in that privileged position. So then you got to think about yourself. How do I think about people? How do I think about trans identified people? How do I think about black identified people? How do I think about all these people and where does it come from? The process of unlearning is challenging those assumptions and then recentering it from the lens of those people who come from that experience. So that's why unlearning is very, very uh, important. Actively combating, meaning it can't just be a one and done. These isms that we are dealing with are huge, large scale issues. And they happen in every single sphere of our world. So are we combating racism within church spaces? Are we combating racism within workplaces? Are we combating racism in hiring practices, in academia, in all these different spaces? Or are we being silent and just saying it is what it is? Because once again, your silence can be complicity and allowing these systems to continue. But if you are actively challenging those systems by saying, hey, this system by which we are judging people is rooted in a system that is not equitable. What are we doing to make it more equitable? That is being an accomplice. And once again, using your privilege of being from those positions to where you can make change is also an example of an accomplice. Accomplices also independently and proactively learn and research about marginalized communities of which they are not a part of. So are you doing what you need to do to educate yourself? Now, this isn't, once again, demanding education. This is about actively seeking it out. So you can engage in conversations about race with people who are from those marginalized communities, but it needs to be done in a way that is authentic. And the way that it is authentic is about the way that you approach individuals, right? So let's say, for example, Sharon Osborne, going back to her experience, if she had just said, you know, I don't understand why this situation is racist, would you be willing to let me know what am I missing, right? It's all about the approach. But when you go up to someone and say, educate me, educate me, don't you sound like a slave master? Don't you sound like a racist person demanding someone who doesn't have the same power and privilege to you to do work for you that is not paid and engage in labor? So that's why it's important that you think about that. And we live in an information age. I love Google. I love Google because you can literally type in a few words and you get information right then and there. And there are so many resources out there to learn about different, different experiences, to learn about different cultures, to learn about how to engage with different communities. So you can do the independent work <clears throat> of engaging. And that demonstrates that you're willing to be an accomplice rather than just say, I don't know, and just staying at that place of, I don't know. They ask insightful questions at the appropriate time when they cannot find the information themselves. The appropriate time is like this. I've made myself available for these questions, right? I've said I'm willing to engage in this type of dialogue and in this space to be educated. That's what is appropriate. But when I'm on my lunch break, Now's not the time to come up and ask me questions unless I've invited you into my lunch break for that reason. This is my ability to decompress. This is my ability to just be black and just be and breathe for a moment. As I often have to tell people, black, brown people, marginalized people, we are not your diversity textbooks. Okay? We are not here for your education unless we make ourselves willing and available to do that. 
So that's why you got to understand that it's not my job to educate you unless I make myself available. And then that's the appropriate time. Because I know a lot of your coworkers, especially after the events of what happened to George Floyd, we had to deal with a lot of our own issues, but we also had to deal with a lot of other people's pain because they were looking for people to process with. And they didn't ask us for that. They just automatically started talking and explaining it. I'm all like, sweetie, boo, I got to deal with this on the regular. George Floyd could be me easily. So in this right moment where I'm trying to deal with this is not your moment unless I invite it for me to educate you on why this is messed up and educate you on why we have seen this for hundreds of years. But if I invite you, then it's appropriate. They amplify the message of the communities that they've learned from without expectation of credit or reward. You're doing it because it's right. You're doing it because you feel a sense of connection to that community. I can't tell you how many times I have seen and heard from people who I thought were friends who said, haven't I done enough? I'm like, I just want to live. Haven't I done enough to demonstrate that I'm a human and not worthy of being attacked? Haven't I done enough to be a human and be worthy, so to speak, of not having to deal with racism? So think about it from both perspectives, that this is a continuous journey. And that if you deeply are doing this because of, it, of this work, you don't need credit or reward. You're doing it because it's right. And then also, and most importantly for me, they step in when harmful behavior happens, especially when their own privileged community in order to provide respite to the marginalized. So when we have these discussions about racism, accomplices are gonna be the ones saying, hey, let's engage in this conversation to their white counterparts. for a lot of reasons. One, because they're going to be able to connect in a way that I'm not. They're going to be have access to that conversation in ways that I'm not, and I get to take a rest from having that conversation again. So what I'm hoping we get from this is that it is so incredibly important that if we really are going to dismantle these systems of oppression, we have all got to be committed to doing it and we all have to take a part in doing it. It can't be just mere silence. It's got to be, we are engaged and we're going to do intentional actions to be engaged in this work and have difficult conversations, change policies, change mindsets, and not only rely on the marginalized communities to do all of that work. So someone I would like for y'all to be is Jane Elliott. If you're not familiar with Jane Elliott, I definitely recommend that you Google Jane Elliott, learn a lot more about Jane Elliott. Jane Elliott is an amazing diversity facilitator who has done research and work on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and on racism. And she makes it her job to literally go to white communities and educate white communities on racism. She is a great example of what is to be an accomplice because she's willing to go into those communities where I don't have access to and say, here's the mirror. Here's what we are doing. And she even acknowledges her own complicity in the act of what we do to not dismantle this system, to make it easier and better for marginalized communities. She educates her own community. She engages and talks about that process of what it took for her to unlearn some of the preconceived notions that she had about black and brown people. And also engages in that dialogue and she's not defensive. She's not defensive. She is like, I am fine. She's like, I am, will be fine as an older white cisgendered woman in the United States of America 
she'll be fine. But other marginalized communities who don't have access to the privileges that are afforded for being from that position are not. So to engage in that work and to engage in the critical conversations and engaging in the unlearning is so necessary. So don't be sharing, but definitely be a Jane Elliott. So I'm gonna talk now about some ways that we are going to move from ally to accomplice. First and foremost, I need y'all to accept, you're going to mess up. Honestly, that's probably the number one thing that I have seen so many people not engage in the critical work when it comes to learning about marginalized communities is that they are so afraid that they're gonna mess up. They are so afraid they're gonna say the wrong thing. They're so afraid that when it comes especially to trans issues that they're going to misgender someone. They're so afraid that they're gonna say the wrong thing. And they get so afraid to the point that it prevents them from doing the work. That is not what any of us wants. So that's why I tell everyone, first and foremost, accept you're going to make a mess and that you're going to mess up. Because guess what? It's in the messing up that you learn. So making mistakes, completely OK. But it's about the ways in which you make those mistakes. So if you make a mistake, if you say the wrong thing, apologize and let it be an honest apology, one that comes directly from the heart and just make that commitment to doing better. The worst thing you can do is get defensive and get angry at the individuals in the communities that you're trying to be in community with for acknowledging that you made a mistake. I can't tell you how many times that I have seen white individuals who get immediately defensive and angry when we say you need to use people's pronouns correctly or that the way to address people is to address them in this way and the ways in which they want to be addressed. And then immediately it's like, oh, I'm just doing, you know, I'm here, you know, that shows that I am in community, that shows that I am an ally, that shows that you need to respect me. And I'm like, sweetie, let's remember which community you just came into and the rules of engagement of this. Are you truly here as someone who is in community or is this just a show? Because if this is authentic, you're going to respect how the individual wants to be acknowledged and, and discussed. You're going to respect the community telling you what it is that the community needs. You're not here as a dictator. You're here as an accomplice. Because I can tell you, if someone in the midst of anything just messes up and they're just like, oops, or I apologize, I'm sorry, make that commitment to doing better, that's someone we can work with. Because we're all on a continuous journey of education. We're all learning about each other. I make mistakes and I've been doing this for a long time, but even when I make my mistakes, I acknowledge it, recognizing that I made that mistake and making the commitment to do better. So I free every single one of you on this call to make mistakes and be okay with it, all right? So free yourself, free yourself. I think there might've been a comment, just wanted to make sure uh, I acknowledge it before I move on, but let me make sure if I can see it. I might be able to see it. Okay. Second part, listen, listen, listen. Cannot emphasize this enough, you have to listen because it's in the listening that you learn. When we engage in racial justice work or in any work with any marginalized community, once again, they have to be the center of their experience. And their voices have to be the ones that we listen to. So when you go into spaces like an LGBTQ plus caucus, or you go to a Black Lives Matter event, know that we're going to center our voices 
because we're the ones that are being attacked. We're the ones that are the most marginalized. Your job in that instance is to listen and learn. It is not to co-op and center your voice. It's not to say, hey, 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 this is what I think we should do unless we suggest and ask for advice. Your job is to listen. Because if you're listening intuitively and you're listening authentically, we know you're in that space to be an accomplice because you're valuing our voice that is often not heard. So that's why it is so very important that when you're engaging in this and you're moving to that accomplice mindset, it is your listening. Because I will tell you, allies are very quick to interject and very quick to offer their opinion, even when it is not solicited. And once again, if you do that, you're demonstrating, hey, I know better than what you do. I tell you, it's funny when you see PhDs in African-American studies who happen to be white coming to tell you what the black experience is. And you're like, um, I live this. I got the PhD when upon birth. You just now catching up. And I need you to remember that. And I say it like that very directly because it's like, why are you dismissing my experience, my lived experience from what you got out of a textbook? Trust me, they are not equal. And that ally can go over here. But my accomplice over here who is listening to my experience and then saying, hey, Brandon, you said this thing, you know, about the whole PhD from birth thing. What do you mean about that? Well, boo, I'm glad you heard me because now we can engage in some dialogue here. So to my, you, my friends, I say once again, listen, listen, listen. Through that is a process of learning and we can move forward in our education together. Because trust me, if you listen to me, I'm going to want to then do what? Listen to you. Because once again, we all have oppressions that we're all dealing with that all need to be addressed. And when we learn from each other, we can best work together to defend against all this. All right, number three, learn to unlearn. So once again, I talked a lot about this, but it is so very critical that we have to learn to unlearn. What I mean by this is we got to challenge a lot of the assumptions that we know and ask ourselves, where did this come from? One of the biggest ones that I've been dealing with a lot lately has been, when did I learn the connection between police officer equals good? Where did that come from? That the automatic connection is police officer equals good. I thought about that and it went all the way back to elementary school. One of the first places that I ever met a police officer was in elementary school when a police officer came and did a presentation. They had that kind of unfettered access to immediately control the narrative that, hey, I am a police officer, therefore I am good automatically. It wasn't a place to be able to question that, that was automatically what uh, what, what the association was. And then over time in my interactions, that has not always been and definitely hasn't been proven always to be the association. But there are so many associations that we automatically learn through our process of education and we don't get the opportunity to challenge where did that assumption come from? So this also goes back into what standards are we using to judge each other? and to judge our society. So when we think of professional standards, ask yourself, who developed those? So like, for example, when we talk about standards of dress and things in that nature that are considered to be professional, many of them would not view African-American clothing as being professional, but they are. But I'm expected to go by standards that did not have me in mind. And my expectation is to conform rather than you unlearning 
then I'm just as professional right here in this wonderful t-shirt and jeans that I'm wearing and imparting all this wonderful knowledge to you. I don't gotta be suited up. Because it's more about what am I saying and what am I thinking and how I produce rather than the standards by which you are judging me that don't have me in mind. So we have to once again be in that process of once again challenging these assumptions and do these assumptions always ring true? For example, why is it that we automatically perceive Black neighborhoods to be violent? Where did that assumption come from? So my friends, once again, when we engage in this process of unlearning, we can relearn and reimagine systems that are gonna be more rooted in equity and more rooted in all of us thriving rather than only one of us being at the center. Be committed, be committed. One of the things that often people get afraid of, especially when having critical conversations about race or any other marginalized community is that they're gonna offend someone, especially someone that they have a connection to. That's why I use this quote. You don't lose friends because real friends can never be lost. You lose people masquerading as friends and you're better for it. I can't tell you how many people are afraid to have that critical conversation with a friend who they know is being racist and who they know is being homophobic, who they know is being transphobic because of the words that are consistently coming out of their mouths, but they don't want to rock the boat. Once again, your silence is complicity. But if you acknowledge to that person, hey, what you just said is racist. I need you to really not engage in that language and to think about that. If they're truly your friend, you're not gonna lose them. What they're gonna gain is that you're educating them can lead them down to a better path. So we have got to be committed to doing this work and being committed to each other as people that when we see people engaging in any of these isms, we're going to be committed irrespective of friend, foe, anyone, family member, that we are going to engage and call these things out and have this conversation with them, even if it means losing them. And generally, you're not going to lose them. I mean, even my own father, and my dad is in his 60s. I have had to have very critical conversations with him about the LGBTQ plus community. And yeah, I've had that fear that I might lose my dad. But you know what? I'm committed to myself as a member of this community. I'm committed to the LGBTQ plus community to say, hey, dad, that phrase that you just said is transphobic. You need to not say that. And here's the reason why you need to not say that. Now, doing that is not a sermon, even though I can give a lovely sermon, by the way. Another day for another comment. But what it is, is once again, an invitation to have this conversation with someone who I have a deep connection with, and he'll feel more invested in it because he knows me. Now, if this was coming from one of you lovely folk, he may not be as receptive because he doesn't have that connection, right? So once again, us being committed to this work and leveraging our connections is engaging in that accomplice work because we're willing to put our relationships on the line for something that needs to happen. I'm gonna go on a very serious moment for a moment. How many of you are familiar with Emmett Till? Thank you for showing hands. Think about it this way. If any one of those individuals involved with the Emmett Till situation had stepped in and been an accomplice to say what we are doing is wrong, Emmett Till could still be here. The fact that his accuser has admitted, or really hasn't publicly admitted, but has gotten pretty close to admitting that what she did was a lie. That 
that is a sign of an accomplice. If any number of those individuals surrounding that issue came out publicly and acknowledged what happened, that is the intersection that is needed. But the silent and complicity of that still hurts today. I don't know if any of you have seen those photos, especially of lynchings, which will break your heart. It really will break your heart. But one of the questions that I always have when I see those images of all these people standing around a body that has been hung and burned is that none of you had the humanity to intercede. None of you had the humanity to say this is wrong. Why? That life matters way more than any of these friendships. So I say these are two examples, but they're real life examples of when we are not, when we say nothing, it has real honest consequences. So we have got to be committed once again to speak out. Okay, get your fellow people. What I mean by that, white people, get your white people. Black people, get your black people. Latinx people, get your people. When we see any of our isms happening, it is our duty for once again, us to get our own people. Because once again, they'll have a better connection to us and will hear us. But once again, it stops the oppression from happening. So once again, and I will reiterate it, white silence is violence. It, it truly is. You can't be silent because it is complicity. And in those last two examples I just showed you, it does lead to direct violence. But even in the black community, it happens. So when I hear transphobia, homophobia, being echoed out of people who look like me, I have a duty to the communities that I am a part of to also say, don't engage in that. Because if I am silent, it gives them permission to think that they can maintain those ideas and then also commit violence against someone else. So it's our duty to each other that we get our own people because once again, we all will get entry into different communities based off of our complexions. And we need to use that to go into those spaces and have these conversations. So we are gonna get our people. Take direct action. Taking a direct action instead of letting life happen to you. That means that this requires once again, intentional actions. The accomplice will take the photo, walk away. I mean, the ally will take the phone and walk away. The accomplice, they're going to go and get in front of the community. When I am out there doing actions and we have individual, we have the cops who show up, immediately the accomplices are the ones who will get right in front. Because they know they are more likely going to hit me and knock me out. But if you in front, they're less likely to do it because they're going to take your complexion of protection into account. This also happens in our workplaces. The great Shirley Chisholm said, if you don't have a place at the table, bring a folding chair. What she means by that, pull yourself on up to that even if you're not in that place in the space. But for my friends here who are in those hiring decisions, who are in HR, who are in those leadership positions, if your workplace is engaging in practices that are not friendly or supportive of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you need to take the direct action to fix it. And if you're not willing to do that, then you need to bring those individuals who are the most impacted into the room. Tell them to bring the folding chair and you're gonna create the space. Or we're gonna push that table over and build up a new table with some nice new benches. That's gonna accommodate all of us to have a seat. That's the, the direct action. The ally will just be all like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, the company had this policy. That's it, we just have to abide by it. Oh no. Mm -mm. People make up policy. If we want change, we can demand it. We can make it, we can create it. 
So we have to take the direct action and not just let things slide. And once again, that applies to every single community that we're a part of. All right, I will take a moment because I think we're doing decent on time. Just want a breathing moment. Miss Mary, I think you had your hand raised. That's okay. I was raising it for the Emmett Till question, but it took me a long time to do it. So I'm sorry. If you still have your question, feel free to put it in the chat. All right, I want to just take everyone, take a moment to breathe. This can get a little heavy. Let it out. Everybody good? See, this is the moments in which I wish I was in person because I, I like to bounce around a bit, get things a little bit more lively up because once again, this could be very heavy. It's very serious, but at the same time, we got to feel good about what we are doing. But yeah, to, to those who ask for the corporate, uh, to, for the corporate uh, clients, once again, create that space to where you can have these authentic conversations and take what you learn and actually implement it. I mean, I think we've all been in that place and space at work where it's like, why'd you ask for all these experiences to drudge them up and then not do anything with it? Do you know what happens? You just leave us feeling angry. All right. All right. So we'll go back to it, but just wanted a moment for breathing before we engage in some more dialogue. So difficult conversations. So some do's and don'ts when you're trying to have a difficult conversation. Five very ineffective strategies. Do nothing, try to sidetrack the conversation, appease your participants, terminate the discussion, become defensive. Especially when you're engaging in difficult conversations related to race and marginalized perspectives, you can't be once again an ally and do nothing. You gotta do something about it. Um, the sidetracking the conversation, this is happens when you're at the dinner table, someone brings up that they wanna have a conversation about race and you're all like, oh, did you see the game last night? Don't do that. Don't do that. No, no, we, okay. Let's have this conversation. What, how would you like to start? appeasing your participants. This is when someone says something truly negative and you just let it sit there because you just want to keep everything nice. Oh no, you got to call that out. You can't just be appeasing. Um, when conversations get really heated, there's an instance to once again, want us to get back to being nice and we terminate the discussion. You got to let that discussion play itself all the way out. And then once again, don't become defensive. But some effective strategies. Understand your racial and cultural identity. You gotta understand how your privileges are gonna operate within any discussion. So once again, if you are a white identified individual trying to engage in a conversation with someone who is a, uh, of a different race, understand once again, how your white privilege can play into that conversation. So once again, this is where you're not going to demand for education. You're going to understand that this person is not required to engage with you. So you may want to remember those kind of rules and engagement and how your privileges interact. When you're, for example, a cisgender person having an, engage, uh, an, engage, an engagement or conversation with someone who's of a different gender, same thing. You got to acknowledge you, how your race, your race and your culture plays into this conversation. Acknowledge and be open to admitting your own biases. Because when I understand where you're coming from, you can understand where I'm coming from. And we can still have that authentic conversation because we understand each other and we know the rules of engagement. So if you have biases, it's okay to acknowledge them. It will lead to a more authentic conversation. So for example, if we're having a conversation about ice cream and you got yourself a good chocolate bias, okay, I know that. I understand and recognize that. Now me, vanilla fan, but at least I know where the bias is coming in where we're having this conversation. Same thing with race. When you have a conversation and you're saying, hey, I've grown up only around white individuals. I have not had many interactions with black people. I can understand. You've grown up in this culture that that's the only examples that you have and you have very few examples to draw from. We can have a conversation. 
and thank you for acknowledging your biases. Validate and facilitate discussions of feelings. One thing that academia, I think, does a huge disservice is to make it seem like feelings don't matter when they really do matter. Because when you're facilitating this conversation, you got to acknowledge there's going to be places of pain. There are going to be places of anger. There are going to be places of realization that happens. And you have to acknowledge that that's where that person is coming from. You don't want to weaponize your positions. So for example, we've heard the phrase white tears. White tears are a very real thing. And this generally happens when a heated conversation comes up you are overwhelmed with the emotion because of what has happened. You don't understand. You're feeling like you're being attacked. The way that you weaponize your white tears is when you do it to the point where you don't continue the conversation and it ends and everyone is focused on you. What you do in that situation is acknowledge, I'm having a difficult moment right now. This has brought up some difficult emotions for me. But I want us to continue to have this conversation. I want to acknowledge that this is the place that I'm in right now, but I'm not saying that your pain and your experiences are invalidated because of my tears. That's the way to do it. Because that way you continue to acknowledge that what you're feeling and they can acknowledge your feelings as well, but you don't end the conversation by centering yourself. You can control the process, but not the content of a race talk. What I mean by the process is you can control the rules of engagement, but what is said won't be controlled. So for example, I will tell someone, especially someone who is of a different race than me, if they want to have a question, a conversation with me, I'm like, okay, great. Here are my rules of engagement. One, we will not disrespect each other, meaning any racial slur that is used will end this conversation immediately, especially if it is perceived from me that you're using it in a derogatory fashion. I get the chance to say I'm tired when I've reached that level and that I'm willing to continue the conversation when I don't feel less tired. I will acknowledge how I am feeling in this conversation as I will acknowledge your feelings as well. Aside from that, we're gonna engage in this dialogue. In that, once again, you're controlling how the rules of engagement work. Another way of doing that is saying, hey, I will allow you five minutes to say everything that you wanna say. I will not interrupt. I will listen, I will process. Sometimes I'll take notes because I wanna make sure that I acknowledge exactly what you said. Then when you are done, I will repeat back what I th thought I heard. So that way you can correct any misconceptions that I may have. Then when that happens, I will respond with the same five minutes, asking you to do the same, retelling me of what I said, process, and we can continue. That's a good way sometimes to have that good back and forth in a sense of a debate style, but it really isn't with that intent. But it's once again, the ways to control how we will talk so that we're hearing each other, processing and giving each other that space, but also controlling the rules of engagement. Validate, encourage, and express admiration and appreciation to participants who speak when it feels unsafe to do so. I always like to tell people it's Vegas rules. What we say is between us, unless they want it to go out at elsewhere, in which case you ask that permission. Thank them for engaging in this because it is emotional labor for everyone when you engage in a difficult conversation. And so you have to acknowledge that. So I always thank people who are willing to engage in a conversation with me because they don't have to. And thanking them for trying to create as much of a safe space to where I can be brave 
because I want a brave space where I can just, and I don't mind, I take a brave space anyway. But we need to create those spaces where we can authentically be ourselves and have these conversations and not feel that it could be a detriment for engaging in those conversations. So one very difficult conversation people have a problem with doing, we're gonna talk about defund the police, abolish the police. So the first and foremost thing I want y'all to know is defund is the right word. What many people do when they have these conversations is they get so caught up with the word. And I'm like, no, you need to have the conversation about the issue, not just the word. Defund is the right word. Here's the reason why. To defund, and this is the definition that I encourage you to use, is to withdraw financial support from, especially as an instrument of legislative control. So when we call for the defunding of police, we're doing that because it is a way of legislatively controlling the activities of the police. Because think about it. If you keep getting giving money to an institution consistently, what are they thinking? We must be doing a good job. We keep getting a raise. It's the same thing that happens with police. If you keep giving police forces more and more money, you're funding their activities and suggesting that the ways in which they are doing business is working. And clearly it's not working. The fact that since 2016, we have had an increase in the amount of people who have died in officer involved shootings and a decrease in the amount of police who have been killed by civilians should tell you that the ones who really should be in fear of their life is us and not them. But if we keep giving the money with this increase happening, doesn't that suggest that we're okay with police killing civilians? So from a logical standpoint, Defund is the right word, because once again, we're using the money as a, a form of legislative control. Now, for those individuals who believe in abolishing the police, what many people think when you hear that is one day you have police, the next day you don't have police. That's not what that means. What abolish the police is, it goes back to what I talked about in my first presentation. When we talk about the police as an institution, we have got to think about the history of policing. Police started off as slave catchers. So as an institution, they have a racist history. When we call for the abolishment of police, we're saying we want this system to be gone. We want the racist history gone. We want individuals who have come up and have learned this system and it has been entrenched in them for over 20 plus years to be gone. And what we want is an entirely new system that is based off of a new history, new understandings, not that same old history. So this would be one in which maybe the force is based in neighborhood policing meaning your neighborhood watches are your central one of points of uh, points of protecting everybody. Maybe this is based in, we're gonna use psychologists and social workers to be the ones who respond to issues related to mental health, related to homelessness, related to other populations. And it's not gonna be a default to individuals who come in with a gun and who also come in without any training or understanding. This is a system based off, you must be from this community to police or surveil this area. Because often what ends up happening is we end up having police who have a history of violence against particular communities, they lose their job, but because they there's not a continuous system of understanding that police record in a former municipality, they just move to another town over and get to do the same thing to that community. 
And also because of the fact that they don't have any ties to that community, they have even more license to just do it because there's no community ties. So when you're engaging in the conversation, the term defund is the correct term, but don't get caught up in the terminology. Talk about the issue. The issue is, is this system really protecting and serving all of us? Is this system centered in an equitable lens to where everyone is being protected and feels protected? Is this system capable of changing itself? My answer is no, because every single time that we try to put legislative control of the police, police officers unions take out those accountability measures. So clearly the system is not willing to work with itself, to fix itself. And then the central question, what would a new system look like? Be open to the reimagining of systems. Who's to say we have to keep this? Who's to say that we have to keep education in the way that it is? Who's to say that our immigration system has to stay the way that it is? Who's to say that hospitals can't be different? Mm -hmm. And that healthcare needs to be different. So what this does is once again, let's not get caught up on the language and the word. Talk about the issue and then be opening to the reimagining of the full system because we create all this have the ability to create all this but we also have the ability to say you know what maybe these institutions that have been around for hundreds of years don't work anymore let's use our collective brain power and imagination on what could be a great system now for our time all right so enough about me and enough of me talking i want to engage in some dialogue so hints I wanna hear what have y'all thought from these last two sessions? What questions you have? What do you wanna talk about? Let's talk. And remember, you're permitted to mess up. So don't worry about that. Oh, see, I know y'all are some opinionated people, okay? Cause I, I, I've seen your faces, okay? So I know y'all got thoughts. <laughs> Well, and, and here in Austin, we are engaged in a, an ongoing um, public discussion, if you will, about defunding the police or transforming the police or reimagining the police um, situation. Yes. Um, and, and I've been hesitant to call it defunding. Okay. To me, the, the things that are going on are reallocating mm -hmm. along the lines that you said, you know, well, let's get psychologists and sociologists to deal with the people who have mental health problems, not the folks mm -hmm. with, with guns on their belts. Mm -hmm. um, let's put the data collection and data management work in the hands of the data guys, not in an officer that's wearing a, wearing a badge. Mm -hmm. um, so, but but the, the folks who are very supportive of the police force get really torqued when you use a term like defund. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a little taken aback when you said defund is the right word. Um, but I think that some of the people on our city council who have been pushing it are thinking about it the way you are, that we need to talk about the legislative approach here. And right. if we bring money into it, we are rewarding the status quo. Mm -hmm. So this has been a helpful conversation, but how we get, how we get our brothers and sisters who don't appreciate that to um, understand that defunding is the right thing is a challenge. And I think it's also, and thank you for sharing that, uh, Ms. Joyce. I think it is, once again, helping them to understand why it's the right word is part of that, right? Because immediately when you think of it, once again, it's that process of unlearning and being open to unlearning. Because immediately when you hear the word defund, all these negative connotations come in, all these imagery things come in. And it's like, no, 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 let's take a moment and we're gonna be willing to unlearn, but also realize why, what's the issue here, mm -hmm. right? What is the thing that we need to happen? Oh, thank y'all for those who have to jump off. Um, but yeah, 
that's the reason. For, and also on top of that, the reason why I think you also think about one of the effective things that I talk about, an easy way for people to not have a conversation is to do what? Sidetrack it. Mm -hmm. So one way to easily sidetrack a conversation, oh, let's get caught up in the term rather than dealing with the issue. And that's why I'm like, sometimes your pushback has got to be, no, we need to talk about the issue. So let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the issue is, is that this, this policing as it currently is, is in need of a change. This mm -hmm. system as it currently is, is in need of a change. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about, can we put more sociologists and psychologists in, in the streets? Can we talk about maybe we need to reallocate these form, the, the, these funds to solving food deserts, to solving you know, homelessness, because then that will lead to less lack, which will lead to people not engaging in any type of practice that could be termed as criminal. But once again, it's easy for people to sidetrack the conversation by doing a dirty bomb like that. And I'm all like, oh no, we're not gonna get sidetracked. We don't have the conversation. Yeah. Um, Hello, Scott. Hi. Uh, um, I'm autistic. Um, That's cool. One of the things in, uh, in the discussion that gets over they defund the police and bringing in social workers and psychologists and things that mm -hmm. if you've not interacted with the mental health system or known mm -hmm. people who had my mother's been institutionalized there's a lot of aspects of it that are very carceral in nature mm -hmm. people who do response are not necessarily good mm -hmm. institutionalizing people is trading and and it's not equitable across race. I mean, I've oh. been admitted and was fortunate enough that I'm white, that I had a better outcome than um, other people have. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yes, getting the weapons out of it so that the people aren't armed, that's a huge improvement. But it's not necessarily, if, if you don't do anything to fix that system, you're not necessarily replacing it with something substantially better. I feel you on that, Scott. Uh, here's what I always, here's what I say to that. I want it all to be fixed. Yeah. You got to fix it all the way, right? Because yes, there is an incarceral element to mental health that I'm like, we got to deal with that too. Yeah. Because I'm not for putting people in any type of prison. <laughs> so we need to fix, because... Another thing, how, for those who are from Harris County, you probably have heard this, but I hate when this happens. They talk about how the biggest provider of mental health services is Harris County Jail. And every single time I hear someone say that, I'm like, aren't you hearing the problem with that statement? Inherently, there is a problem with that statement. Mm -hmm. If you're not willing to even acknowledge the problem with that statement, that's why we got to engage in what well, this conversation and engage in. We have got to fix this system because the jail should not be where you put individuals who are dealing with any number of mental health issues. We need to then maybe allocate those funds away from that towards mental health facilities and not make them into incarceral systems. But yeah, I agree with you is that that's another reason for why you got to make the linkages to these conversations because you got to fix all that. And trust me, it's definitely a part of the conversation because the incarceral state of the way that we treat people leads to the easier dehumanization of us, which also leads to the feeling that we always got to weaponize ourselves against each other. And I'm like, oh no, I would much rather someone who is mental health trained go and see the signs to know this is someone who's having a mental health episode or a mental health issue. Where is the appropriate place that we can give this person support? And it definitely ain't a jail, <laughs> okay? And it's, it's not a lot of, the, of our facilities that we currently have. So maybe if we reallocate and instead of weaponizing systems, we can put it into a better facility that can do the better job of addressing the actual issue, which is mental health. So thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna just jump in and again, hey, thanks, for, thanks for the whole discussion, but just a, another little thing that I haven't heard mentioned just for everybody to think about. 
Yes, sir. My wife and daughter are both blue-eyed redheads. There is blue-eyed redheads. Okay. It's blue-eyed redheads. And there is a term, and it is more derogatory in Great Britain than it is here, uh -huh. but in certain parts of the country, and partially where my wife grew up, uh -huh. uh, it's used. It's called ginger. Uh -huh. So I think another example for people who are not of color to think about is to think about the use of terms and how that's done in people who you could say are of the same race, but they're not of the same cultural background, or they have some minor differences. That's number one. Thank you, number sir. Two, number two is, um, let's talk about defund a moment. Go for it. Think, think about the last, oh, I'll, I'll make it 15 to 20 years for sure. You can go way, way back, but with media and everything, a lot more things get reported. What comes out of all of the investigations of how the police departments in many communities have reacted in certain situations? Oh, we have the need for change and we make the commitment for change. Well, that term hasn't been working. No. So at a certain point, you gotta excuse, excuse in advance uh, my metaphor, you gotta pick the two by four up and get somebody's attention. <laughs> here, here. Oh. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Qu qu question for you, because um, I definitely think your example is one that is so important that it happens even within uh, our own communities as well. Um, first off, I think that's a beautiful conversation of blue eyes with red hair, because I'm just, I will say, haven't seen it very often, but I was like, I love that combination. What is a more acceptable, if there is? Yeah, I, I think it's just back to your back to your point is just that you have one a conversation between one human being and another, and why do you have to even classify? There you go. That, that's really the answer on that is that the classification is Perfect. arbitrary, and we've as a human race we've used that. You study history for since any history has been either passed down uh, verbally or written down, it's that's existed, and it's a tough thing to change. Perfect. Thank you for that, sir. But exactly, that's the dialogue, right? Where I'm learning more about, well, where's the origin of that coming from? What is the appropriate way for someone to be addressed and just be like, hey, we learn and make that connection. So thank you for that, Mr. Ken. All right. I want to leave y'all with a few resources, but also give some time to Ms. Denise because there's some additional resources that the diocese, uh, diocese is also providing. So let me one more time share this with y'all. So Google is an amazing thing. As we all know, there are so many different resources. I highly encourage you all to go to Google and look up different resources on how to be a better accomplice. But here's a couple of ones to look out for. Opportunities for white people in the fight for racism is whiteaccomplices.org. So um, feel free to look at that. Uh, there's an amazing article that I use as the basis of this presentation called to promote true advocacy, don't be an ally, be an accomplice, 103 things that people can do for racial justice. And then always feel free to look out for local organizations engaging in this work, check them out, ask them questions, ask for someone to engage in this dialogue with that you can be able to practice with. I open myself and volunteer myself as tribute as someone to always be able to practice this with as well. So hopefully you got these resources in case you didn't take the photo or anything of that nature we can also send it out as well. This is just the start. It is just the beginning. The thing that I want every single one of you to do is to make a commitment to take the lessons that you've learned here and apply it to the conversations you have with everyone in your life. We are all on a journey to learning and being better because our society demands it. We have got to acknowledge each other's humanity. We have got to move from just saying I support to demonstrating that I support. So if you stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, if you stand in solidarity with stopping Asian hate, if you stand in solidarity with LGBTQ plus communities, if you stand in solidarity with just other humans, 
then we can't just be allies. We have got to be accomplices because we have so many isms to fight and it's going to take every single one of us making intentional actions in order to do that. So this is just a start and I hope you continue your education. Once again, if you ever, 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 ever want to contact me, you can feel free to do so. Here's my wonderful contact information. Once again, this has been a pleasure. I will turn it over to Ms. To Ms. Denise with some final comments and some resources that the diocese has to offer. Well, Brandon, thank you. Um, thank you. I mean, I have so enjoyed being with you and with everyone for the past couple of weeks. So I think I speak on behalf of all the diocese. Um, I think you really helped us answer a lot of things that we get a lot of conflicting information out there and to really hear you speak to it um, was really, really helpful. So thank you. And uh, hopefully we can get you back and continue this conversation because I really think you just, you just framed it, right? This is literally just the beginning. These are the seeds that get planted in all of us and we figure out even more so how do we work into being um, an accomplice. 